Welcome, gentle reader. We're so happy to have you back with us for another outdoors episode of Everything is Everything. Um, Amit, dappled and drowsy in sunlight and shadow, what is on your mind? So these days, I've been thinking about the scene and the unseen. Scene and the unseen. Tell me more. So I don't mean my podcast. My podcast uh, title was inspired by an essay by Frederick Bassia. We'll talk about it in the next episode. Spoiler alert. But, uh, you know, when it started, what the phrase meant to me was the unintended consequences of public policy, blah, blah, blah. As the show expanded to deep dives into subjects and then deep dives into people and oral histories, the seen and the unseen began to mean something else entirely where I would look at hidden layers behind society, behind our own minds, etc., etc. Right? And one aspect of what is unseen to me is the things that we normalize in our lives that are almost like the oxygen in the air that we uh, breathe. I think David Foster Wallace once had the story about one fish asking another fish how's the water today and the second fish says what's water right because it's so normalized for them it's all around them and that's one aspect of the unseen for that second fish the unseen is water and I want to talk about one such unseen thing for all of us which is Electricity, right? The plug point that we take for granted, it's ubiquitous. You plug in an appliance and it just works. We expect it to work, especially in Bombay. In some other cities, sometimes there is a little bit of a binary. It works or it doesn't work. But we never think about what's behind that. So, gentle listener, I want to, or rather gentle reader, as Ajay prefers, I want to take you on a journey with me. And in that journey, I want you to dive into a plug point and then travel through the wire, zip, 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 zip and travel and you come out at the other end going back in time and what is at the other end and all of that is unseen. You know, we get power, we take it for granted. Where is it coming from? What's going on? Uh, you know, how does a natural world play into it? What are the costs and benefits, etc, etc. And I'm really excited about today's episode, gentle listener, because it's on a subject that a, Ajay has deep, deep knowledge of, he's an expert in it, and uh, uh, and you're going to take us into that plug point and out the other end. So, let's start. Let's do it. So, Ajay, give me a sense of power. Where do we get it from? Where, where does electricity come from? Uh, what do you describe as the old world? What is it? So I agree with you precisely on the way you articulated it, that it's something magical. You know, we've just grown to take it for granted. Imagine if you got to a time machine and told, you know, the most powerful majesty of the Middle Ages, you went to Akbar and you told him, I can plug in this and flick a switch and all kinds of magic happens. It's magic, okay? It's a sufficiently advanced technology that is indistinguishable from magic. It just works and we don't think much about where it comes from. So let's get going on how these things were done in the early stages. In the early days, uh, the electricity system, what is colloquially called the grid, was generally run by the government. So there was a government behind the scenes doing the entire upstream, that somehow magically there would be some big industrial producers of electricity and various things would happen leading up to our plug point. Okay, and we were the dumb users that we would flick a switch, electricity would flow, it would be metered, we'd get a bill at the end of the month, hopefully. Okay, in some parts of India, you would steal electricity, you would occasionally get bills, all that stuff would happen. Now, behind the scenes, what's going on is like this, that there are multiple different generation plants. Okay, there would be, in the olden days, a coal-fired plant, a thermal plant that burns coal, a gas-fired plant, a hydel plant. Okay, there is a negligible amount of nuclear in India. Primarily, it was coal, hydel, thermal. And these are big industrial facilities. And they are producing electricity and it is transported at a very high voltage in order to keep resistance losses down. And then it comes to a substation where it is reduced to lower voltages. It comes to the building at 240 volts and it goes to every plug. Okay, so that's the grand machinery that's going on behind the scenes. Trouble is that the human electricity consumption is not fixed all through the day. So first, I just want to disabuse us of the notion that I switched on the TV, so the electricity consumption went up slightly. The thing is that in any precinct, in any uh, substation area, there are thousands of people and there is a diversification. There is an insurance-like aspect where one person puts on a TV, one person puts off a TV, all those things cancel out. So we don't need to think of the individual fluctuations of one person switching on an air conditioner or switching off an air conditioner. But in the aggregate, it is quite smooth and it is quite predictable. So one remarkable fact 
about electricity is much like with insurance. So in the world of insurance, the number of car crashes today that will generate an insurance claim today is highly predictable. It's not risky. Meaning for an individual having a car crash is a surprising event. For the insurance company, it's very predictable. Smoothly, day after day, a certain number of people who had a life insurance are going to die. It is smooth. Unless a COVID comes along and then you get a surge in excess mortality. Okay, So like that, while the electricity decisions of any individual putting on and off one switch are random, by the time you get down to any kind of geographical aggregation, then cancelling out happens and there's an insurance-like character and it becomes highly predictable. And a thumb rule in this industry is 15 minute slots. So you think of what will be the electricity consumption from 6 to 6.15. What will be the electricity consumption from 6.15 to 6.30. Okay? And then you can put a bunch of statistics into the play and you can get very accurate forecasts. So based on the weather forecast, based on various other things, whether there is a cricket match going on, blah, blah, blah. You put in a bunch of explanatory variables, do a nice statistical model and you get extremely precise estimates on a per 15 minute basis of how much will be the electricity consumption in a given place. Now this data is seen by the managers of the grid. Okay, So these are some wise, all-powerful people running the grid behind the scenes, very often civil servants. Okay, And what they do is then they think, what is the production facility that is the cheapest to deliver for that given 15 minute slot? Okay, So they ask themselves the cost minimizing question. That how do I get the correct amount of electricity to meet the projected demand for this 15 minute slot? Unfortunately, not all electricity sources are easy spin up and easy spin down. So it turns out that coal fired plants require a couple of hours to spin up and a couple of hours to spin down. So you can't do it suddenly. Like you're going to switch on a coal fired plant, then it's got to run for some time because you're just wasting a lot of money and it's not available on demand. At short notice, it's not available. If something changes, like imagine it's an unusually cloudy day in Bombay and then fewer people are switching on air conditioners in the evening bracket. More people are switching on ACs into the night because on a cloudy day, the sunlight, the heat from the earth that goes out in the evening gets reflected by the clouds and comes back to the earth. So you get a warm, balmy evening and night. Okay, so all these fluctuations happen. And that can happen all of a sudden that suddenly at five o'clock, a lot of clouds came. Then you don't have the time to tell a thermal power plant, a coal thermal plant that hey dude, I need you to spin up because we've had an unexpected surge in supply. Then you need rapid spin up and rapid spin down technologies, which are gas and hydel. Okay, So this is the way the world worked. That in the olden days, there was a sarkari guy who was a grid manager. Mostly there were sarkari thermal plants or gas plants or hydel plants. If there was some private investment, the private guy was a vendor. There would be like a 25 year contract. There would be no thinking. It is not a world of business. It is really you're just a canteen contractor to the government. Everything is fixed and you just keep on generating electricity under a contract with the government and you get some fixed regulated rate of return. It's not actually a serious business. You're just a pure vendor to the government doing a narrow outsourced function. The government calls all the shots. The government is the business thinker of this piece and the grid managers are solving the supply demand imbalance 15 minute slot to 15 minute slot. They are brave heroic people. We value their work. It's like an air traffic controller. It's a very fran frantic job that moment to moment they're responding to problems. They're solving problems. And you know, we the fat, indolent, lazy ingrates of the world get this illusion that we just throw a switch and magically the electricity just happens. Fat, indolent, lazy ingrates. You know, I've got to tell you that I actually tried what you mentioned over here. I went to a coal power plant and I said, hey, dude, I need you to spin up. And you're right, it was very slow in responding. I didn't hang around for a couple of hours to see if it started responding. So this is the old system which you've described. And we typically know how central planning works and all the inefficiencies and all of that, you know, what can go wrong and uh, uh, what we lose out. So staying with this old world for a moment, uh, you know, what are the pros and cons of the system? Because at one level, those who have the engineering mindset will say, Ki, ha, itna kuch ho hai. there's surges from here, there's shortfall there, somebody's got to plan it, we need the planners, etc., etc. So yeah. give me a deeper insight. So this runs in, the difficulties of the system run in two parts. So in the old days, 1970, you went to Australia, you went to Britain. This is a completely Sarkari system. 
I shared your biases. There was an incredible amount of inefficiency and waste. And it all boiled down to higher payments for electricity. So finally, you get taxed. That it turns into expensive electricity one way or the other. So you need to think deeply about the inefficiency and the wastage. And it turned into a higher payment by the people for a government-run electricity system. But it was a stable equilibrium. Okay. Some people, for example, in the UK, started on a reforms journey that how can I turn this into a normal market where there are prices, where there are fluctuations, where there are incentives, where business people take risk. Okay, If a business guy gets a 25-year locked-in contract, there's actually no risk. They're just doing a managed operations function. They're actually not running a business. So the dream of electricity reform became that how can we apply our universal philosophy of markets, of competition, of private risk-taking and uh, innovation and creativity into this field. And while this made some progress in certain areas, it was frankly of second order. Okay, Then came the great, incredible scientific and technological revolutions of electricity. Okay, So basically driven by the problem of climate change all over the world, there was an immense explosion of R&D on trying to improve the energy system. And that has given us miracles upon miracles upon miracles. We've got miracles on solar electricity. Okay, It's hard to believe how cheap and available solar photovoltaics are. So the electric solar panels, which convert sunlight into electricity, are called SPV, solar photovoltaics. These things have had a compound rate of cost reduction of something like 20 or 25 percent for the last per year for the last 30 years. So can you imagine? Like a compound gain of 20, 25 percent for the last 30 years. It just gets cheaper year after year. There have been miracles of science on making this better. I remember uh, there is a great scientist, Shockley. He's one of the three people who invented the transistor. Shockley, Brattain, and Bardeen are the three Bell Lab scientists who invented the transistor. One of the cool results that Shockley had was from first principles of quantum mechanics. He derived something that is called uh, Shockley and some second person, I forget the name, a limit for how much sunlight can be converted by a silicon cell into electricity. This is from physics. Okay, it's some 12% that you can't beat 12% efficiency. So if, you know, the solar constant, 1000 watts per square meter comes down, you can't get more than 120 watts per square meter, says this theoretical physics limit. But you can never stop human ingenuity. So the humans started thinking, very well, I won't use silicon. I'll start using other materials. I will start sandwiching them in multiple layers. So I'll first put one silicon layer. It will take 12%. Some part will penetrate. Next, there'll be a second layer. Okay, the madness of the human mind is unbelievable. So, we got progress on solar electricity, we got progress on wind, on windmills, and we got progress on the demand side. I want to tell two stories, which are just like memorable stories to die for. Wind. Okay, you think that, yeah, you put up a windmill, right? How complicated is, is it? And then uh, you naturally think that all the genius of aeronautical engineering of figuring out a propeller will work here. You want to figure out the rotor blades of a windmill. Ha, karo, it seems reasonable. Well, watch the innovations. Like first, you start saying that, I want to go off the ground because I get a stronger wind there. If you've ever flown a kite, right? In the early stages near the ground, the kite kind of struggles. But once you get off, then you get those powerful winds upstairs. And, you know, hello, Viral and Vikram. You can put a dozen kandils on a kite that goes a kilometer or two kilometers up. So there's a powerful wind up there. So can I take the windmill higher? So I want to make a bigger and bigger windmill. Then you want a blade that is very big. Oh, then you get to material science of how can I make very large blades, which will not break, which will have a life of 25 years, which will be lightweight, strong, giant blades. Answer, yes, we can do that. And the scientists went and did that. Then they got unhappy. You know, I'm trapped by the surly bonds of earth. I want to go even higher. I want bigger, better, more. So they thought, let's go offshore. And it turns out that the simple flat profile of the sea allows an even stronger wind offshore. And you can go even higher and you can make windmills even bigger. So offshore wind is magical in terms of the high wind speeds that you capture. And then you present the scientists with the challenge that I want a blade that's like 100 meters each side. So imagine the two rotors are 200 meter big blades. And in the sea, in the shallow coastal shelf of the coast of India, 
you will do the construction work of putting the steel pylons into the ground under sea. And above that, there will be a 200 meter whirring windmill and a, a generator attached there. And you'll transport that electricity to the land. Like amazing scientific change has been happening. And then I turn to the demand side. Okay? You'd have thought Thomas Alva Edison invented the tungsten bulb. And, you know, I'm old enough that we used to think bulbs are cool. And the puzzle used to be how can you increase the life of the bulb? Because bulbs would keep blowing. So you want to fill the case of the bulb with a noble gas so that even though it's heated, it should not oxidize and the uh, tungsten filament should not break. Okay, and the great innovation then became tube lights, fluorescent lighting, where you got higher efficiency, where you got the same light at uh, a higher efficiency compared to tungsten. Well, then came the LED level revolution. So roughly speaking, in a tungsten bulb, 10% of the energy goes out as light, 90% goes out as heat. It's actually a heater. Okay, it is something to heat up, to use for heating, like in a homemade food dehydrator. At the other extreme today, in a LED light, you have 90% efficiency. This is just miraculous gain. You went from 10% efficiency to 90% efficiency. And who would have thought that LEDs, like exotic technology, would first achieve white, which required cracking blue LEDs that great Japanese uh, scientists in uh, University of California at Santa Barbara figured out blue LEDs. And then this was exotic, expensive technology. Then it got consumerized, it got mass produced. Today, everywhere in India, we get LED bulbs. Okay, these are all miracles of science and technology. So, these three miracles happened. The demand side learned greater, more energy efficient technologies. Wind production got better. Solar production got better. There may be a couple of other scientific miracles in play like geologic hydrogen, like geothermal, okay? There's no telling what other innovations will come. Now, all these things have messed up the life of the electricity grid. So you'd have thought that a grid engineer would extol all these cool developments in science and electronics and electrical engineering that I'm describing to you. It actually messed with the simple, boring, predictable, sarkari life of the old electricity system. So what happens is, in the afternoon, the sun is shining and solar panels are today cheap and if you get the economics right, which many countries don't, if you get the economics right, there will be plentiful energy in the daylight. The sun is just, it's like free money. There's money wafting down from the sky. So here's an amazing proposition. Did you know that on many days in the summer in Germany, the price of electricity goes to zero? Can you imagine the idea of electricity? being at zero. And why did that happen? Because there was so much solar capacity. Now that's Germany. Germany actually doesn't get, get a whole lot of sunlight. Imagine in India, if you could get this right, the sunlight is plentiful. The business case for doing those same solar panels is even stronger here. Okay, We have a large amount of policy failures in the field. But if you pause to imagine the world that, you know, imagine there are no policy mistakes. Okay, it's easy if you try. There can be sunlight and sunlight and sunlight. And the price of electricity in, in the afternoon can go to zero. Okay, what would we do if electricity was essentially free? Okay, just all kinds of imaginative applications will come. So my favorite idea is you basically charge up your EV in the afternoon for free. Okay, and people will buy a backup battery pack and charge it in the afternoon as well. And then basically personal transportation becomes free. Can you imagine a world where you just put down a capital cost for a vehicle and the fuel cost is basically zero? What a revolution it would be. What a miracle it would be. The trouble is this doesn't fit the world of the grid engineers. Okay? Remember, the grid engineers have deluded us and seduced us with a very beautiful thing, saying, look, the plug is there. It's yours. You have the option value. Whenever you wish, you flick a switch, the electricity will appear. But the trouble is, precisely in the evening, when... The humans go back home and switch on their lights and air conditioners and TVs and toasters. And they open the fridge and the cold air of the fridge is lost and the compressor kicks on. Okay, So all through the day, the fridge is sitting closed. So it uses less energy for the compressor to run. In the evening, the person comes back home, opens the fridge and the cold air is lost. And then the compressor kicks on. All these correlated electricity consumption events generate a surge of electricity demand in the evening. But precisely in the evening, the sun goes away. Okay, so at the worst possible time, your best possible source goes away. Like, what could be more cruel than this? And so suddenly, the people are used to saying, hey, you promised, 
plug point, electricity. Okay, I flick the switch, my damn AC should start working. Don't tell me you can't do it. But the poor grid engineers are really suffering. It's very hard. How are you going to overcome this? That in the afternoon, there's plentiful electricity. People don't want your coal thermal. Okay, every wholesale buyer is setting up their own wind, their own solar, saying, I don't want to buy expensive electricity from the grid. But Shamko, they run back and say, hey grid, give me electricity. So the poor grid engineers in the old world are really unhappy and they are being pushed against the wall and spare a thought for their sadness because their life has been made really difficult. That we the people have grown used to this comfort saying electricity, I just fire a switch and behind the scenes everything is going to happen. How is it going to happen? There's not enough gas and hydel to solve the evening problem. And you can't gun the coal plant all the time because in the afternoon and the night people don't want that much coal. And coal plants can't spin up and spin down effortlessly. So what are you going to do? There is no good answer to this question. And this is the puzzle and the conundrum that we face. So Ajay, I want to introduce you now to two slang words which you used in your spiel a few moments ago. Can oh. you think of what they are? Two slang words, I never thought I'd hear them from you. One of them, my good friend Anand Ramchandran, who I often think of as the funniest man in Indian history, used to write a great blog called Son of Bozi, remarkable chap, wonderful human being, introduced me to this term and I think it's basically Chennai slang, but the word is blade, right? So do you know what blade means? So as a slang term, blade means, uh, it's, there's no exact translation, but it basically means like damn boring. Like this is blade da, you know, that kind of thing. So, and I just want to say that you are the opposite of blade when it comes to talking about engineering because you make engineering sound like so much fun. If I had been taught like this in school, I would have wanted to be an engineer. Thank God I wasn't, right? Because I'm happy the way I am. The second term is tube light. You must have heard of this in slang, yeah? So when it comes to understanding my jokes, my bad jokes, you are a tube light. You get them the next day. However, when it comes to assimilation of knowledge, you are anything but, you're just the opposite. But tube light is also a great metaphor for the Indian state because often change has this enormous lag. The real world changes and then the state is kind of struggling to keep up and they're 10, 20 years behind mostly. And what you just described about the world of uh, renewables at one level, it's so fantastic and hopeful. You know, the things that solar is doing, that wind is doing, and we'll talk about uh, uh, nuclear later. But at one level, it is incredibly hopeful that, oh my God, technology has brought us here. We can solve so many of our problems, including climate change problems. However, at another level, our system is struggling to cope. We are stuck in the old world as you describe it. So tell me a bit more about what your solution is for this. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to take off on some of your sentences. What you said is deep that if 25 years ago you deeply understood the problem of climate change as many people did then you were just stuck like how on earth are we ever going to solve this how on earth will we ever get to a net zero because the entire edifice of modern civilization is grounded on fossil fuels and many people just thought that it's game over there is no way out that the earth is headed to become a venus and there was no other way out but by God, human ingenuity has overcome. We have attacked energy at a scale that was unimaginable. Nobody could have dreamed that the solar and the wind and now, you know, there is promising stuff happening in geothermal, in geologic hydrogen. This is stuff which will just hit the ball out of the park and take us to a completely different level. So, you know, one should never count out human innovation. One should never count out the power of the human mind on solving these problems. So what has happened is a miracle. And then old institutions are the bottleneck. It is human institutions. It is the frailty of our society and our institutions which holds us back. It is because we have not woken up. We did not get the memo that the world has changed and you need to do things differently. And then we tend to be stuck in old institutional arrangements. You know, so uh, there are ways in which I am at once a conservative and a liberal. I'm a conservative in the sense that I never want social engineering. I never want somebody else to tell us what to do. I'm a liberal in that the world is a blank slate and we should rethink ourselves. Meaning, I want all of us to ask first principles questions to ourselves, saying, how should I live differently? And, you know, can I be flexible and can I innovate and can I rethink my life and arrangements in the scientific and technological 
environment of the modern world as opposed to some old fossilized conception of society and i know like i'm right now i've just managed to offend everybody so i've offended the conservatives who think that there is something to value and treasure in the old culture and i've valued the uh, progressives who want to use the government as a big stick to solve whatever they don't like in society i'm basically i'm the universal outlaw i'm the universal outcast <laughs> i have to say that we are both outcasts because the way i describe myself is as someone with liberal ends but conservative means uh, like you know some of my great heroes of the indian freedom struggle like gk gokhale rana day uh, uh, agarkar and so on so you're exactly like that but continue yeah so the problem is always at the root cause at the institutions and you've got to think from scratch Okay so now let me play with sentences and words and I will take you on a English literature journey to the solution okay when you hear the words that the electrical engineers who are the grid managers work in 15 minute slots to reconcile the inconsistency between forecasted demand and supply okay now you, your llm when you hear the words gap between supply and demand what do you spit out you say markets you say price system right i mean every trivial uh, 300 parameter llm knows that when you say reconcile a gap between supply and demand that's what the price system does it's like that's the horse you trot into the race when the job spec is solve a problem of a gap between supply and demand so when somebody says to me that look there are gaps between supply and demand largely predictable because the demand moves smoothly but there is a gap there is a apparently irreconcilable problem and uh, both sides need to adjust again dharma of economics don't ask only the supply to adjust don't ask only the demand to adjust both have to move and that's the socially efficient way of doing now the grid engineer has no way of telling the buyer to adjust because the price of electricity is fixed and you've given them this lovely option value of flicking a switch anytime so the grid engineer only works on the supply side and it's inefficient because you have so limited adjustment power and the adjustment is all administrative you're ordering people hey mr gas i want you to switch on now mr gas has their own objectives they want to make money they have their own profit motives and you're always in friction with the producer because their objectives are to make money they're not there to serve you and you know you'll try to tie them down in contracts but people will use every chink in the contract to go off in a different direction it's not fundamentally incentive compatible okay and so the simple solution the deep solution the unsubtle idea is prices Okay, let the damn price of electricity fluctuate. Okay, so I already said to you the price of electricity in Germany in summer in the afternoon goes to zero. Okay, and that immediately made me dream. And the price of electricity in the afternoon in India on all days except cloudy monsoon days should be zero. How great would that be? Not twenty days in summer in Germany, but two fifty days in India, two seventy five days in India can have bright sunlight, and the price of electricity should basically go to zero. okay but that's a price and then in the evening there's a shortage of electricity when an economist hears the word shortage you think price okay the prices should go up so the amazing solution the remarkable solution was in the pages of adam smith in 1776 which is let the prices move and things will start happening so let's start thinking of adjustments okay so there are three main adjustments that start happening when the price moves just to fix intuition I want to start by saying no adjustments. Okay, just in today's world, you allow prices to fluctuate. In the afternoon, the price is like zero, point two five or point five. Okay, and I mean point two five or point five rupees per unit, where currently your thumb rule is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rupees a unit. Think that it's going to become point twenty five, point five, sometimes zero rupees a unit. Literally zero rupees a unit will happen sometimes when the sun is shining, and you know. things are great three adjustments are going to happen so what will happen at first is imagine the i'm going to stagger out the moves first comes the pure price system in the evening there's a shortage because the sun is gone and the people are going home and switching on their air conditioners okay and the price will explode and the price will go to 15 rupees a unit 25 rupees a unit 50 rupees a unit okay that is the meaning of prices that fluctuate okay and nobody should whine nobody should say those guys are profiteering okay they are there giving you the flick of a button electricity in the evening when the solar is gone i mean the sun is a fickle friend okay he like misbehaves on you when you need him the most okay so you how can you uh, rely on the sun then your 
trusted, faithful, good people are there in the evening bolstering you, holding you up. And then you got to pay them a premium for it. So maybe 15 rupees a unit, maybe 25 rupees a unit, maybe 50 rupees a unit, whatever. I mean, the market will choose a very high price. And now think of all the consequences. So consequence one, you and I will have the spot price of electricity fluctuating every minute on our mobile phone. And I think it is not unreasonable for people to glance at the price of electricity before deciding whether to switch on an air conditioner or choosing the temperature setting on the air conditioner or with a trivial amount of electronics. The air conditioner's remote control will allow you to choose a varying temperature setting based on the price. So if the price is below 2 rupees a unit, then I want 20 degrees in the room. But as the price goes up, I want, I'm willing to live with higher and higher discomfort. And if the price goes above 15 rupees, I want the AC to go off automatically. I will rather sit out in the open, sipping a glass of cold water with ice bracket. The ice was made in the afternoon when the electricity was free. Okay, people will come up with all kinds of responses. You will be amazed at how much people will redesign their life in return for cheaper, for lower expenditures on electricity. So think about the firms, okay? I feel that firms should organize themselves so there's basically one shift in the day when the sun is shining and then you should not work in the evening. So firms should religiously like shut down at 4.13 in the evening by which time solar prices have started uh, going up. Okay, and restart a next shift at 10 p.m. Okay, so run a shift from uh, 10 in the night to 4 in the morning. Okay, and uh, you get a night shift where in the late night electricity is cheap. Run a shift when there is cheap solar electricity. And don't run an office in the evening when electricity is so expensive. Don't run a factory in the evening when the electricity is so expensive. I mean, people will reimagine how to organize production, how to organize their lives in respect of those prices and these adjustments will shift the evening spike okay it'll even out that consumption of electricity all through the day a second big adjustment will be in uh, wind okay currently wind is a bit of a stepsister because solar is so great solar is so cheap solar is exploding okay so spv is magic wind gets a lower priority because wind by itself is not as efficient as solar but the beauty is the wind does not stop in the evening. So the wind can be there in the evening peak. So the wind guy will get a bad price of electricity through the day when the sun is shining and make like a bandit in the evening when the price surge comes. So when the price of electricity goes to 15 rupees a unit, that is the economic case for Mr. Wind. So more wind investments will happen and great, more wind investments will happen. They will produce in the evening and night and they will help to bring down the evening peak. This is a market-based solution. You don't need a central planner. You don't need an engineer to think, oh, we need to put wind. So I'm absolutely not in an engineer-led, centrally planned vision of what is the appropriate technological mix, which a lot of energy experts like to do. Okay, Our insights into economics guides us that engineering decisions, picking winners or which is the correct technology is something that should be done by market forces and people should take business risk. People should start a wind facility thinking, wow, in the evening, there's going to be such an evening spike. I'll make money. And then it turns out actually the evening peak is not so great. A guy will go bankrupt. That is business. That is risk taking. People should not go into this acting like a government canteen vendor. I got a fixed contract. I've got 25 years. I'm going to make money for free. Okay, That's the dullness of the present Indian electricity system, which is a centrally planned system where the government will run a tender, you'll get a 25-year contract, you'll sit back and make money. You're actually not thinking. We've not harnessed the innovative, risk-taking, business model imagining capabilities of the private sector in today's electricity system. Today, the private guy is just a vendor. He gets a 25-year contract. All the thinking is done by government people and you know, this really is not an efficient way to organize society. So the second margin of adjustment is wind becomes more economical because it can produce and serve the evening peak and make money in the evening peak. And the third adjustment is storage, that people will build batteries. They will pump water from the Konkan level in the Indian West Coast up to the Sahyadri's level in the Indian West Coast when electricity is at... 20 paisa and 50 paisa in the day. And in the evening peak, that water will flow back down 
and it will generate hydel power which they will sell into the grid so new hydel capacity will come out of thin air without all the social and uh, economic complexities of dams like building big dams is a messy thing here this is simple small projects where you'll basically have one lake with about you know 1 million tons of water small lakes like that and you will get uh, a stored pumped uh, hydel facility where uh, it, it's a battery and of course then there are revolutions of electricity storage of energy storage using lithium ion batteries and such like again what is a battery it's a business you should not think sarkar karegi it is a business people should see that i can buy cheap and sell dear i can buy at 50 paisa and i can sell at 5 rupees i can buy at 50 paisa and i can sell at 50 rupees great i'm a banya i'll make money and pure profit motive we lead holders and speculators yes amit bhai holders and speculators the heroes of bengali movies will come into this business they will buy energy when energy is cheap in the afternoon and they will wait for the most expensive moment they will hoard the electricity and refuse to sell it when it is 4 rupees and 5 rupees because they are waiting for 50 rupees and at that time they will sell their energy and they will make money and this will happen entirely from private incentives without requiring any central planning okay so these are the three adjustments that will come there is the emergence of demand side adjustments there is wind and i've already mentioned offshore wind and there are some miracles going on off the coast of tamil nadu and sri lanka in terms of offshore wind and there is storage all these three will emerge not because the central planner will decide to tender out a 1 gigawatt hour storage facility but because people will pursue their self interest and they will create storage facilities ajay shah some of my closest friends are government canteen contractors you know they make great medu varas they will be very offended at seeing this episode i love the phraseology that you come up with during these conversations you said hey mr gas you'll go and say hey mr gas you know every time i watch news television and i see some random experts spouting gyan on something i feel like saying to him hey mr gas shut the fuck up so uh, you know i i just want to touch on one question which people have a misconception about because the moment you bring up something like this the first objection you will get is that hey how will the poor afford this this is anti poor and my point is that no this is actually pro poor in two ways number one if you didn't have a price system you would have shortages that is what always happens when you don't allow free prices so uh, you know you would not have electricity at all and this is a reality for so much of india but number two the more important economic process that you pointed out is both demand and supply are adjusting and the demand end of course we change our habits you know i don't really like the office habit because you know uh, midnight to um, uh, you know the late hours of the night a lot of you, you know is against the human circadian rhythm and all that i don't know but you where you absolutely right is that yeah 4:30 offices should shut down and they should start earlier at 7 in the morning or uh, you know wherever the day breaks it's just logical you just adjust the work day and shift it higher so it occupies more of daylight which is a fantastic innovation not as demand side but supply side what i just want to point out and you know emphasize on for uh, dear readers is that the supply side because of all the innovation that is happening in the long run will take the prices below what they actually were and there will be no shortages that is what happens time after time when you allow the price system to play out for example you've mentioned that you know there is a windfall of wind as it were of the coast of tamil nadu and sri lanka you know almost like the the, the, the windfall of oil in the middle east right it is there to be exploited but you will need investments of 14 lakh crores to do it or such like and the point is how do you incentivize people to make that investment it is exactly the profit motive those investments happen and those innovations take place and suddenly that becomes a massive source of power once the infrastructure is in place you know you have innovations in storage you have innovations in areas which honestly are unknown unknowns for us we can't tell what they are today but you incentivize them you have entrepreneurs saying hey i can make some money profit motive and though the holders and speculators get into action and uh, you know and you have prices coming down massively and society benefiting a lot in the future in a world where power is cheaper than what it is today and does not have a cost on the natural environment as it does today and there are no inefficiencies of this sort so it just seems miraculous to me and i feel that you know this power of the price system which you and i are such fans of is just not appreciated enough yeah. Uh, on poor people and electricity one as you said correctly there is just exclusion 
large numbers of people in India are at the mercy of an electricity system that is often not able to deliver electricity correctly. There is a quaint euphemism in this field, it's called intermittency, which is at random you'll get power cuts. Okay. The second is that in the alternative world that I'm describing, on average, the price of electricity will be lower. On average, the payments per watt hour, per joule, will be lower. Because in the afternoon when the sun is shining, electricity will be very, very cheap. So imagine poor people having an electric two-wheeler charging up in the afternoon. Okay, That is the payoff. Maybe you and I will be more wasteful in our behavior. We will just plug in our EV and say, charge karo yaar. Or we're willing to pay a little higher price because no, I bloody want to be sure that my car is charged because I have planned a long ride at 9 p.m. So from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. I'm topping up my car. Okay, you and I would do that. There are people who would be more price conscious. Great. There should be a spectrum of expenditure points and price elasticities in the system. I want to use airline travel as an analogy. If you will fly a red eye, you will get cheaper tickets. Okay, you want to fly at 8 a.m. on the Bombay Delhi flight, you'll pay more. That's fair. And so people at different budget points will self-select themselves. Some people are willing to pay 15,000 rupees and 20,000 rupees for a one-way ticket to Bombay Delhi where you are very price insensitive. So fine, it's your choice. Or you say, no, I want to be frugal. I want to be mindful. You'll be careful. You'll book your ticket at the correct uh, moment, maybe one or two weeks ahead of time. You'll pick like a 11 a.m., 12 noon slot and you'll get a 4,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees key ticket like that. So there will be various choices rather than one single flat government regulated, government defined price all through the day and then you know some planes are full, some planes are empty. That's the problem of what we are seeing in the electricity system today. So you know everything about this is incredibly exciting. I love the sun, I love the wind, I love water, I love prices but there's something that I love almost as much so let's save our next chapter for that. So Amit, I've talked about many, many scientific and technological advances. What is the stuff that gets you going? So the stuff that really gets me going, and I feel really strongly about this because, uh, you know, conventional thinking on this, sadly, is so wrong, is nuclear power. Right? People conflate, you know, they think of nuclear, they think of nuclear bombs and the damage they've done, or they think of nuclear power and they'll think of Chernobyl and they'll say that, oh, this is not an option, it's too risky and all of that. And that's actually completely wrong. Now, in the show notes, we are going to link to this excellent essay in the New York Times by three authors, one of whom is Steven Pinker, and I'll quote a couple of passages from that to talk just about the safety aspect. The reality is that nuclear power is the safest form of energy humanity has ever used. Mining accidents, hydroelectric dam failures, natural gas explosions and oil train crashes all kill people, sometimes in large numbers, and smoke from coal burning kills them in enormous numbers, more than half a million per year. By contrast, in 60 years of nuclear power, only three accidents have raised public alarm. Three Mile Island in 1979, which killed no one. Fukushima in 2011, which killed no one. Many deaths resulted from the tsunami and some from a panicked evacuation near the plant. And Chernobyl in 1986, the result of extraordinary so Soviet bungling, which killed 31 in the accident and perhaps several thousand from cancer, around the same number killed by coal emissions every day. Even if we accept recent claims that Soviet and international authorities covered up tens of thousands of Chernobyl deaths, the death toll from 60 years of nuclear power would still equal about one month of coal-related deaths. And, and, you know, 60 years and one month of coal-related deaths is a staggering comparison. And what really happened at Chernobyl, and I'll talk right about it again right at the end of the episode in our recommendations, is it was a grand failure of the Soviet state, not the technology. And the technology and safety measures today are so advanced that it could never happen. Now, people conflate nuclear power and bombs. And this is, no, we mustn't allow it and all of that. But the point is that there are 24 countries in the world today which have nuclear power and they haven't gone towards bombs. You know, there are plenty of safeguards put in place by the international community by which it simply isn't possible. People talk about nuclear waste. The truth is that nuclear waste doesn't take up much space. You know, what that article in NY Times also points out is that 60 years of nuclear waste generated by American plants can be stored in one Walmart. 
and I know Walmart is pretty big, but in just Walmart. And we actually have real world success stories of this type, namely France and Sweden. France, and, and by the way, what a lot of people may not know about France is that they've had nuclear research going on for decades into the past, around the same time or even predating the great innovations in America and elsewhere. So it, it, it's been one indigenous strain of R&D that's been happening there. They shifted to uh, nuclear power to the extent that today 71% of the electri electricity production is from uh, nuclear, approximately 71%. They decarbonize their grid decades ago that there is a measure that people use of how much carbon is used per kilowatt hour and France is one tenth of the rest of the world. So it's been a spectacular success there with 71% electricity generation from nuclear. It is clean energy, it is safe energy, it is cheap energy and uh, you know and and no climate change impact at all because you know you've, de you've decarbonized uh, massively. And it bugs me that somehow because we think of the world in tribal terms, we don't evaluate each idea independently, we think in tribal terms. Something that happened in the 70s was that the no nukes movement, which was based on these preconceptions, was taken up by environmental groups. So environmental groups, green groups everywhere will say no to nuclear, no to nuclear because of dogma based on misplaced beliefs of the past. And this is just daft. If you care about the environment, if you care about climate change, you should embrace nuclear. Like to me, it is such a big part of the puzzle moving ahead. So I'd like to know your thoughts on this. And I'd also like to know, uh, you know, where's India on this? Because this is it's a magnificent opportunity for us as well. Yeah. Uh, my quick summary of the Indian journey is that uh, there was a nationalistic and self-reliant strategy starting from Homi Bhabha leading up to you know, Indira Gandhi and Pokhran where uh, the idea was you want to get to nuclear weapons. I'm fine, I see that case. It's a separate debate, but I see that logic. Such a self-reliant, uh, nationalistic, uh, government-led Swadeshi strategy is phenomenally inefficient when it comes to economics. So you, you're just not going to build lean, mean, efficient electricity generation factories for use by private electricity utilities by going down a worldview of Swadeshi nationalism, self-reliance and being prickly about foreigners. So we should just decouple these two things in our mind completely. Nuclear energy is a business and nuclear weapons is for a government lab to keep making some nuclear weapons and by and large we're pretty much done there. I don't think there is any value added in building a large number of nuclear weapons. I think India has enough weapons to destroy the entire planet. So I don't think that it needs to be an active nuclear weapons research program. You don't need to make bigger, better, faster, more. You're done, meaning the nuclear weapon story is over. Nuclear energy on the other hand should be the game of a private competitive globalized capitalism. I was one of the early people many years ago when I was in the Ministry of Finance before the Indo-US nuclear deal that understood this clarity and separation where it became clear that the private sector in the United States and in France was making reactors that were commercially competitive as a source of energy, which could not be said about reactors being made in India. Reactors were being made in India as a science project as a demonstrator that, you know, some Sarkari scientists know how to make a reactor, which is nice. But you should never conflate nationalistic objectives with the game of achieving economic development. They're two separate stories altogether. So, yeah, it's good that Homi Bhabha and others led the journey that climaxed in 1974 with the nuclear explosion, dot, 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 to uh, the Indo-US nuclear deal. India today is accepted as a status quo nuclear power with all the ability to buy nuclear equipment, nuclear fuel, everything. Okay. However, after the Indo-US nuclear deal, not a single American or French reactor has showed up in India because of a problem around nuclear liability. And it is, in my opinion, the failure of the Indian regulatory system and the government system and the political system that we have basically choked foreign providers of reactors. Effectively, what we want to say to an American maker of a nuclear reactor is that after you've sold the reactor into India, forever, no matter who made what mistake, if something goes wrong and there is an accident, you are liable. And then the vendor says, sorry, under those terms, I'm not ready to sell you a reactor. It's like, you study my reactor. 
you analyze the safety characteristics of the reactor after that you take responsibility you're going to man it you take responsibility okay so in my opinion the indian political system's decision to block all foreign reactors has negated the essence of the nuclear deal meaning manmohan singh and george w bush did a brilliant nuclear deal which as i said was precisely this expression that we will be a nuclear power when it comes to having nuclear weapons and that's a military and a foreign policy strategy question but when it comes to energy we'll just say who makes a good reactor and we will buy cheap reactors so we're stuck on this question the last point i want to make is that there's a beautiful new development in this field that is called smr small modular reactors this is something approaching a black box that can be put in a corner of a factory which is a 50 megawatt reactor that's it it's a 50 megawatt plant more or less a black box so it's an uncomplicated box that you will buy from an engineering company which will go sit in one corner of your factory which is a 24 hour 50 megawatt electricity plant and it's early days yet we're not yet clear how well this is going to work but it's a revolution in the engineering possibilities and i believe that in the future you know an aluminum factory any big energy user will use these kinds of things and they are zero carbon so you're ready to make aluminum in india using an smr export into europe not face the carbon border taxes be competitive you know the whole thing so smr is a wonderful thing i just waiting for it to achieve commercial feasibility but once again we will hit the indian problem of nuclear liability no global vendor is going to sell the reactor and say forever the liability of any mistake any problem that happens in the reactor is the manufacturers that's not a fair statement it's like saying i sold you a car and 30 years from now you had an accident and i am responsible i think that's not a correct position i've always been wondering ajay shah that i've been in your dinky little mumbai flat and one third of the flat is taken up by this big black box is it a reactor <laughs> can you so, no but you know i i i i just want to you know uh, before i get to my next question underscore a couple of the uh, points that you mentioned is that i have often spoken on both the seen and the unseen and on everything is everything we've discussed at the admiration i have for the nuclear deal that manmohan singh pushed through because he put his political survival at stake the left parties were against it uh, Uh, sonia gandhi didn't want it and manmohan took a firm stand and said that i will not be prime minister if i cannot do this because it's good for the country so tremendous props to him for doing that now unfortunately after it's done we face a liabilities issue the example that came to mind where when you were talking about it is say hyundai sells me a car but they are held liable for every accident i may have for all of uh, eternity and they are held liable for that for all their cars of course they will not sell me any cars if that is a condition i set upon them it is absurd it is bizarre it is against all rules of common sense but be that as it may i now have a question for you so aj has my next question you uh, you know you mentioned nationalism many times uh, in the last chapter and it is a bugbear with me also because you know one of the fundamental truths about markets is that the larger the economic networks you can form around you the more benefit diversity is great numbers are great you know multitudes contain the road to heaven as it were so but nationalism mitigates against that national uh, nationalism is an isolationist uh, approach it's an exclusionary approach and it simply doesn't work and that got me to thinking about you know is there a role of foreign policy in this as well you know we think it's just economics and central planning and blah 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 and that's a dilemma. we have to figure out but no nationalism and foreign policy is also part of the puzzle isn't it yeah the field of energy does contain a strand of foreign policy that is worth thinking about um i have a funny story on this i have when i was young i have heard vague allegations that uh, in 1971 when uh, there was a bangladesh war the uh, middle eastern states cut off oil supply to india okay this is a vague statement that i have heard and because it was only a 14 day war it turned out to not be an issue because the pakistani army surrendered and there was no choke point of oil and this lingered in my head because in a way it made no sense on the other hand like what if saudi arabia was deeply collaborating with the united states in that episode could this have actually happened like you can this is so big you can't leave it as a vague allegation so i have worked on tracking down the facts 
about this. And I got through to a person who is a personal friend of the Indian ambassador to Saudi Arabia of a certain period. And I have it on full authority that no, this never happened. It's just a vague rumor that was made up to try to portray the Middle Eastern states as being hostile to India. Okay, so these are the ways in which there can be a toxic brew here. In the event, this turns out to just be an urban legend. It was not true. It never happened. You talked about uh, Manmohan Singh, George W. Bush and the nuclear deal. This is make or break because as I said, I was in the Ministry of Finance and I was. it was dawning on me that like the Kalpakam nuclear facility, once you actually reckon its costs correctly, it's just not competitive. It is not an efficient way to make electricity. And, you know, maybe it's a 50-year path, maybe it's a 100-year path for Indian scientists and engineers to develop that engineering capability. And who knows whether and when that will happen. Remember, the glory about the nuclear reactor industry elsewhere in the world is that it's a private industry. It's not government labs. So it's a different level of capability, competence, sophistication. You know, So when Westinghouse makes reactors, they are a private lab and a private engineering facility who will always be more cost conscious, more innovative, more risk taking. It will not be a bureaucracy. They will be able to recruit a certain kind of scientist that you know is not available anymore. So you know the age when Homi Bhabha was the best and the brightest of India and went to work for PARC, first funded by the Tatas and later funded by the Indian state. That age is gone. The modern Indian state does not get that level of the best elite capabilities of the country. So, what is the way out? The answer is you want to buy the reactors made by private French and American companies. But then that encounters this foreign policy choke point that you have to create these conditions. And there again, I want to go after a bigger theme and something you and I have spoken many times earlier. The purpose of foreign policy is not to engage in propaganda. The purpose of foreign policy is not to score de debating points at the United Nations. The purpose of foreign policy is not to assert your pride and ego and create propaganda opportunities for nationalistic political leaderships. The purpose of foreign policy is to make deals with governments of other countries in the way that best suits the interests of the people of India. It is about interests. It's not about all the storm and fury and frenzy of the headlines of foreign policy. So the nuclear deal was a perfect example of a foreign policy success. That the entire Indian establishment was pro-Soviet. How can you make a deal with the Americans? Or the Americans will never accept us. Because you know they hate India. They are hostile to India. The, the entire Indian military and foreign policy establishment is basically aligned with the USSR. They yearn for the lost age of the USSR. It was a foreign policy imagination and effort where you know Narasimha Rao, Vajpayee, Jaswan Singh, Manmohan Singh brought about the rapprochement between India and the United States. And that was led by the better intellectual capabilities and imagination of the leadership of Narasimha Rao, Vajpayee, Jaswan Singh, Manmohan Singh. It didn't come from the entrenched bureaucracy, which is deeply pro-Soviet. Now, all around the landscape, there are similar subtle interactions between foreign policy and energy. Let me show you three that are high on my mind. Okay, so one of them is Bhutan. Bhutan is a miracle of a success story of Indian foreign policy that India has managed amicable relations with Bhutan. India is investing important military effort and foreign policy effort in the physical protection of Bhutan against Chinese incursions. This is not free. This is a cost to India. And it's a tough battle as was seen with the events in Doklam in uh, 2017. But in return for all this, there is a beautiful globalized non-nationalistic arrangement, which is that Indian organizations go build hydel plants in Bhutan, run the hydel plants in Bhutan, transport that electricity back into India, and that land is used, which is controlled by the Bhutan government, and they get a rent for the use of the physical facility in Bhutan. Okay, It's an absolutely great arrangement. 
this is an unemotional sensible business arrangement saying who knows how to build a hydel power plant indian engineering companies who knows how to run a hydel power plant indian electricity utilities who has the demand for that energy india who has the site bhutan so don't think in a nationalistic way let's find the pragmatic solution a business solution that gets this done okay great success a very important cool thing that has been going on for years and years and you know congratulations to all parties for being adults about this okay failure number 1 nepal okay equally there are amazing amount of hydel sites in nepal but the failure of the government of nepal the failure of the government of india these deals have not arisen and there is this whole toxic conflict around the constitution around a hindu state the whole foreign policy relationship with nepal is broken and so this hydel story is not able to unfold there are vast hydel opportunities in nepal which can and should be exploited with a bhutan like arrangement like what is a better deal than in the indian summer the glaciers melt there is more hydel generation and in the indian summer north india wants to run air conditioners there is no better deal in the world than generating himalayan hydel electricity and sending it into the indian hindi heartland where there is a demand for energy but this ain't happening okay foreign policy story number 3 is about the north sea uh, offshore energy discovery of india which is the offshore wind of the coast of tamil nadu and sri lanka okay so first part a is we've got to get our shit together okay so the indian policy establishment has to develop the policy capability to get to the point where private people will bother putting in the vast investments required on the tamil nadu side of the fence so they're not holding our breath waiting for the foreign policy miracle okay part one is solve the mistakes of electricity policy and there is no bigger incentive for fixing the electricity policy framework than tamil nadu okay electricity is a state subject so tamil nadu has to solve it Tamil Nadu has to figure out its domestic electricity system. Tamil Nadu has to create the conditions for offshore wind to happen in Tamil Nadu. And I've described to you how the evening peak is the key to the economics of offshore wind. If you try to give offshore wind a levelized flat price through the day, then there is no business. If you get peak prices every evening, then suddenly the economics of offshore wind changes. Okay, and you need to get the markets, the contracts, the arrangements. Not a twenty-five year PPA. that guy building an offshore wind facility should be a red blooded risk taker he should be a business person taking risk should be a private person running the danger of going bankrupt when they make scientific engineering and business mistakes that is the meaning of being a private led economy that failure is entirely on the table there are no guarantees you don't get a locked in regulated rate of return for a 25 year ppa which is our old sarkari system tamil nadu has to do all that and tamil nadu will reap the bounty okay for an analogy imagine that we were telling the uk that there is a bounty of crude oil and gas in the north sea you have to develop the policy muscle and then you can reap that bounty otherwise fine it's there but if you're too clueless you won't be able to use it that's literally the trade off that is being placed on the table of tamil nadu policy makers it is theirs to win it is theirs to lose it is offshore wind off the coast of tamil nadu it is the decision making and the intellectual capacity of the policy establishment in tamil nadu that will win or lose on this and then comes a foreign policy story after that the union government has to create the amicable foreign policy conditions where we are not getting into fights with sri lanka okay so once again the failure of indian foreign policy is there are no friends in the border every country has been embittered and estranged by india and i do not believe we are morally superior we are as good and as bad as all the others it is a failure of indian foreign policy that we have not created the conditions where the countries surrounding india get a stake in india's prosperity and success and become part of the indian dream where it becomes more like a european union where countries are able to work together where you don't draw lines on borders and we create the amicable conditions more akin to india bhutan between india sri lanka so i'd like to say that under ideal conditions there are there's about a 10 year journey for tamil nadu to get its act together on electricity but it is a 10 year runway for india sri lanka to solve the mistakes of foreign policy and to get to a stable happy relationship but if all this works then there is another giant expansion 
where really it is something for India to lose. It is for Indian companies to go on the offshore wind sites of Sri Lanka to partly sell that energy back into the Sri Lankan market, which is a small market. Most importantly, to transport that energy back to landing points in Tamil Nadu. And after that, Tamil Nadu will be a paradise of renewable energy. It fits into an exporting dream because when you make stuff using renewable energy, you are better placed for the carbon taxes that will come up everywhere in the world. So there is a beautiful economic dream, but it turns on foreign policy. You've got to get the foreign policy done. You know, at the start of this episode, we spoke about the title of my other podcast, The Seen and the Unseen. This illustrates the title of this show, Everything is Everything. Like, who would have thunk that you're going to get into a plug point, do zzzz, zzz, zzz, travel through all the wires, and end up with foreign policy? So, well done, Ajay Shah. Yeah. So, Amit, we've just done that dizzying drive from the electricity plug uh, in every household all the way to uh, the good lord putting up a great bounty off the coast of Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka saying that India, Sri Lanka, get your shit together. I'm giving you such a big prize if only you will understand how to work together. Okay, It is a grand journey and inside it there is the magic of the prize system. The price system is so interesting and important across many, many domains. What are other areas and other fields that come to your mind where the price system is that powerful insight where suddenly we can solve problems in a novel way and really oftentimes people don't get that intuition? So I'm going to take you on another journey, not quite so dizzying, but from one podcast to another. Earlier this week, I uh, released an episode of The Seen and the Unseen with our good friends from Takshashila, uh, Khyati Prane and Anupam. And Anupam Manur uh, is, uh, teaches economics uh, at Takshashila, very fine mind. And one of uh, the subjects which we spoke about and which he's written a great column uh, on, which we are going to link right now, is a uh, link from the show notes and you can see it on the screen, is about water pricing in Bangalore. Like in Bangalore, there's been... Uh, at the time that we uh, are recording this, there's a massive water shortage going on. And Anupam's whole point was that the way past this is this exact this, the exact thing that we spoke about in the context of electricity, that you start pricing water. And again, the classic objection that will come up is, hey, what about the poor? And the point is the poor are suffering anyway. This will actually help them. Right now, the people who benefit from what is going on is the rich who are using far more of water. It is, in a sense, an existing system. Uh, really distributes wealth from the poor to the rich. Now, I've written a column in the past about how every interference in um, free markets is basically a redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich. Right, and a class, the example I used in that particular column was tariffs, but there are so many examples. I think every interference with the price system effectively amounts to exactly that. So, you, you know, for me, uh, that article which I'll urge all of you to read because it's so counterintuitive. Price water, how will the poor benefit? But actually, no, that's the best um, thing that you can do to fix the system in all these upstream and downstream ways, uh, you know, pun very much uh, intended. Uh, what I did last night before we recorded this is I sent a message out to our friends at Takshi and I said, what other examples can you think of? And many other examples uh, uh, came from them. Nitin Pai, for example, said car parking. You have to price car parking. And that makes complete sense because if you just think about it, you know, you have a wall on one side of the house, on the other side is the road. On this big side where the house is, the price of real estate is exorbitant, uh, you know, especially rent in Mumbai, for example. But on the other side, it is free. It doesn't make sense. It means that whoever can get in there gets in there. Need doesn't matter, etc. doesn't matter. And you have shortages of parking everywhere, which is why, uh, you know, despite having um, a, a small dinky car I rather happen to like, I will often take an Uber or some other public transport in Bombay because I just won't get parking. Other examples of this could be garbage collection, for example. You could uh, privatize that. You could privatize sale of organs. I will link to another uh, great piece, part of a newsletter that uh, Prane uh, wrote, where he speaks at length about the economic logic behind this and where in the world it is working differently. Again, it's such a deep and fascinating subject that someday we could do a separate episode on it entirely. So there are tons of examples like this. An old one which comes to mind is from our friend Barun Mitra, who I think in the early 2000s wrote this great piece for the New York Times, Sell the Tiger to Save It. 
because in those days there was a talk of how the tiger is going extinct in china and what his piece argued was you make it legal to sell the tiger because the way the incentives will work is the same way that people today will breed other animals that are legal to buy and sell and for which there is a demand like cows or chickens or whatever people will then breed tigers and you'll actually save the species from going extinct if that is your aim now this is really counterintuitive the traditional way of thinking is that no central planning there are very few tigers left we must save them ban everything to do with them but you bring the price system into play you allow economic freedom and you know voila you know you can uh, and and this of course hasn't been done so whenever i look about me in the landscape there are various areas where we think that uh, you know this is sacred you know the government must control everything market must not play and in a lot of those areas we are suffering today agriculture is an example we've had episodes discussing that i've had many episodes of the seen in the unseen i'll link education is an example we can go into any of the, those at death but the answer everywhere is prices because prices are so powerful in the way that they carry information and incentives absolutely and some more examples to check off vaccines okay I feel that the geniuses who created covid vaccines were not paid commensurately there was trillions of dollars of gains to world gdp when the covid vaccine was built and the prices paid for the vaccines were not commensurate with that level of effort and the contribution that they made to society and a price system where people were able would be able to bid up the price to pay for a covid vaccine would do a world of good both because there would be an allocative impact on who would get the vaccine and it would create incentives for more vaccine research and more capability for the next pandemic uh, similarly surrogacy is another area where i just think that it would be so much simpler and so much more sensible to have a private market but the indian state has come along and banned everything So Ajay what's your recommendation for today? Um I know that people like to read books and that when anybody says report you're supposed to run 1000 miles away and reports are deathly they are boring they are official statements who wants to hear the nonsense platitudes propaganda of any official body however I'm going to recommend a report that I wish for you and everybody to read the annual global energy report 2023 produced by the international energy agency iea uh this is october 2023 it is unputdownable the world of energy is pure drama today and the facts the graphs the stories of this report will really make your day so never ever read a report but this time make an exception <laughs> i'll make an exception <laughs> just for you and amit your recommendation so my recommendation is in the going with the theme of this episode wonderful book called midnight in chernobyl by adam higginbotham people were raving about the chernobyl tv series which is pretty good but midnight in chernobyl by adam higginbotham is just a delightful piece of non fiction reportage which completely captures everything that went on behind the scenes over there and it just shows in a, such a startling manner two things One is the failure of the Soviet state when it came to the Chernobyl disaster itself and how that failure stems from the structure of the system the incentives of the system though those words aren't used but you can just read it and you can say that hey this was bound to happen right and the second thing is the indian state in those years itself because the indian state in many ways was a fax copy of what the soviet state was that was considered a model and our state failed in so many deep ways that you know you and i are of the vintage where we can remember uh, the comic uh, mishaps caused by the uh, indian state and vestiges of many of that are kind of still around us so midnight in chernobyl however if you forget all these ideological points you i might appear to be making is just a wonderful read it's a crack- crackling read you can't put it down though you should at some point put it down because how long can you you know carry a book around so yeah that's my recommendation for the for this week <laughs>